think mechanizations have a huge impact. You know, bigger tractors and bigger machines have replaced people. Um, that's probably the biggest impact of the lot. And paperwork. Paperwork as well, I think. Especially with organic, I mean, that's very, very strict. Um, lots of record keeping. I suppose that's why I like selling things locally as well, because it's almost um, it's almost as if your own customers are kind of the ultimate arbiters of what you're doing, because they're looking at your farm most of the time and they see what you're up to, and then they buy your produce. So that's kind of almost self-policing, isn't it, in some ways? But yeah, I suppose the biggest change, yeah, the biggest change would be mechanisation and um, and that kind of you know huge loss of people working on the land, really. It, the population of Holbrook was completely different. I mean, I, e even in the time since I was around 75, because uh, even then most people would be either themselves or one of their family employed in agriculture. Um, totally changed now to uh, professional people, mostly working in, you know, they're in law or rock hospital consultants and things. Mm -hmm. So, it, uh, yes, the, the village has changed enormously. The cauliflower has actually been the kingpin to our family's success. There was a house here in Pro called Malcolm House, and it was run by a man called Captain Helby, and he was in charge of all the coast guards for the old southwest England. And he had been to France and seen cauliflower growing, and he brought some seed back from France in 1915 and planted them in. Um, down at Malcolm House where they were trying to do some market gardening. These cauliflower grew. Um, he didn't know what to do with them. Grandfather used to go to Dartmouth, you know, with his 1915, he had his T4 then. And so he said, oh, I'll have them. So he took them into Dartmouth and they sold like hot cakes. So he then researched out where it came from. So then he got the fishermen in Dartmouth who went across to Roscoff to bring him back some seed. So we used the seed used to come back and we used to grow cauliflower. Um, cauliflower production at the maximum when we were all farming together, we used to grow 160 acres of cauliflower. It was when my brother John and brother William we were all together. We used to grow 160 acres of cauliflower at say 8,000 to the acre, or whatever that works out to. Little boy watching father with the um, binder and make it put it making the canvases up because I was just old enough to remember it and the thrashing machine coming in and the bind but the binder and the first sheet I saw the first sheet flick out like magic and I couldn't work out what it was and it'd be ch -ch 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 -ch, and then another one would flick out along it fishing the well fishing the well that's what I saw at first um, and to see the ah. Oh, the value of food, the value of food is what, what and then, and the, the, the lengths they went and the steepness of the fields they harvested with the standard fortson and spade logs and then coming around the bottom and they didn't have enough power in the standard fortson to come up the hill. So then they'd have a long wire rope to pull him up over this nip. I just couldn't believe what I saw. When you're born on a farm, you, you've got that freedom to grow up on a farm and we disappear for all day sometimes you know we go down the wood digging all afternoon or we go on our push bikes down the valley so you always had that in you um did i ever see myself as a farmer probably not at 16 no no never did but there's a saying in there when i was 16 my father was a fool when i was 21 uh, he was a good chap so basically you grew up in that period so many people see, see the same but i think dad was different because you always saw yourself as farmer did you Oh yes, uh, I, you know, I, went, I went to school in Street and, and, and then I went to school in Kingsbridge and I can re remember some, just one, in those days careers weren't talked about, I can remember just one teacher asked me what I was going to do when I left school, nobody else was interested and I said oh, I'm going home on the farm and uh, I come straight home from school on the farm and started work next day. Um, and that, that, that's how I went on. And I was then went to day release courses at Bicton um, for five years. And from there on, um, I've always worked on the farm and done nothing different. As long as you work hard and you do well, 
it all works well. So yeah, I would not do anything else different now. But then you talk to Dexter, my son at seven, ask him what he wants to do, he wants to be a farmer. I very often uh, th think of the uh, the views here have hardly changed at all. There may have been a few hedges taken out um, 30, 30, 40 years ago. They were taken out just because some of the fields were a little bit awkward in size and shape, etc. But generally the farm has not changed um, because of it. its... Uh, it's the fact that it's uh, quite hilly with the valley. The valleys, you can't really do much with the, with a the valley other than graze cattle in meadows. I think cattle were always meant to graze in meadows and sheep were always meant to graze on hills because uh, sheep certainly like to be on dry land. They don't like to be walking around a damp meadow. Farmers do have good times and they have bad times. And uh, the, uh, I think the reason for that is that when it's good times, everybody wants to do it. And when everybody's doing it, they get in each other's way. So uh, I think our wealth really is, it's a good way of life and uh, it's healthy to be out in the open. When I was home weekends from school, I used to get all the horse jobs. My job used to be to go out and pick up all the hedge trimmings, hedge parings as we call them, because they were obviously cut off by hand and left down the side of the foot of the hedge, either in the roadside or in the fields. We, and I used to have a, a mate that used to come and help me on a Friday night on a Saturday pick up those hedge trimmings, because they were then put back to one side and kept to cover up the winter crops, like the mangoes that we used to grow. We used to grow mangoes, sugar beet mangoes and swedes. And the mangoes, when well, the sugar beet used to be hoed out by hand, there used to be six of us out hoeing. And we st some would start at like eight o'clock in the morning and, and I'd start a bit later and my father when he arrived was a bit later still, you know. <laughs> used to be, we used to have a few laughs, but it was a qu quite a very laborious job. We'd start hoeing like at the end of April, and we'd be probably finish hoeing at the end of June, middle of first week in July. You had more of affinity with the land too, in that respect. You had more time. I mean, um, a man with a horse and a plough, his daily work rate was about an acre a day. That's what he could plough a day. Well, we now play plow acres an hour with our machinery and i am very fond of plowing i used to do quite a lot of competition plowing at one stage and um the problem with a lot of things you do now that are not there very long for you to appreciate if you did a nice bit of plowing in, in a in a grass field it used to go back nice and firm and you'd be able to look at that for weeks afterwards but not now it's upside down worked over and put into a crop um, everything's so much quicker, so much faster. You have, you don't have the time. You do when you get a crop like that field of barley over here now, blowing in the wind, seeing it rustle like that. That's quite, that's that's quite rewarding to see that. In the old days, when it was when the harvesting wasn't completed in the field, whereas this is when you had the combine harvester in the field, and the grain and the straw were dealt with separately. Before that, we had the binders and I can only just remember that they used to come back into the yard or into a corner of a field and then they were the, the grain was thrashed out of them in October November December even and all the neighbors used to come and help each other then then my father I remember went to Plymouth and found a, a reliable shop in there they would pay him uh, for his milk and they'd, give, they'd pay a penny premium to have the same amount of milk, a penny a gallon premium, to have the same amount of milk every day of the year. Which uh, you may think, uh, that's funny, but if you know anything about dairy, the, the dairy cow will give a lot more milk in the spring of the year when there's grass, and not in the autumn. And so the consequence was that um, he wanted to, to have what he called a level delivery. So we agreed to do that. And my father uh, he did his best to do it. And then uh, if you were a bit, in the autumn, when milk was a bit scarce, you'd buy a new calf cow from Ivybridge Market uh, to keep your 
we were married to Mel Copley, the eleventh delivery. And uh, in one year, I don't know which year it was, he went to the Colonel Bowser to pay his rent. <clears throat> he said, uh, Colonel, I've come to pay my rent. It was in Mickham in September. <clears throat> he said, really what I ought to have done was bought a new calf cow to keep up my level delivery to the, to the dairy. And uh, the Colonel Bowser said, well, never mind about the rent. He said, you go and buy the cow and pay the rent when you can. And that was uh, the compassion from a Kelly estate in those days. You try to rotate your crops. We were mostly grass because we were into milk production. And there wasn't the machinery to deal with the cereals as much as there is today. We used to grow barley and we didn't grow wheat. We never got on very well with wheat. We grew barley and oats was what we grew. You know, we were glad of the straw for bed. You see, all the house, cows were housed in cow houses where they were all chained up then. Whereas in 1960, I think we built some covered yards, which made it, well, it was quite a different farming practice, really, because that's when we had the milk and parlour. You know, we had mains electricity. And, um, well, then you elevated from churns to tanks, you know, insulated tanks and all the milk went in a tank well then the, they used to collect it with a with a tanker they used to come in the yards you know with milk tankers then and take it out right out from the tank so it left the churns way behind 